John is here. Do we start? We're doing it. This is the show. I always feel like I'm really snuck in. I'm still eating a pretzel. You're hard to talk to anyways, because you're either clearing your throat, eating food, you've got a sucker, you've got gum, you've got dip, you've got these fake beers. Fake beers, for the record. Yeah, I'm trying to get a sponsorship, so I brought this up here. Oh, well, then get the, got to get the label Athletic in there. Brewing. Not in the light. It's got like the glare on it. There we go. Over here, over there. <laughs> Athletic Brewing, hi. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, it's a very good product. A lot of uh, like endurance athletes are into this because it's like a non-alcoholic beer, but it's got carbs, uh, water, and hops itself is like a natural anti-inflammatory allegedly hmm. and like natural electrolytes so it's better than a sports drink really so a lot of uh you know the triathletes and stuff i guess they drink this stuff while they're training and like stuff so they're very and these are very good because all the craft beer snobs like got into non-alcoholic beers now so like there's some of no, them. No, there like, actually is like some. Yeah. I like the Heineken Zeros. Yeah. I really like. Yeah, and those, those um, are okay. Yeah, the, yeah. the athletic lights. I really like. Yeah, those are okay. I like the free wave and the run wild. This yeah, one's yeah. upside down. Yeah. So give me a sponsorship, athletic. Let's go. I'm, Send us some. We drink it yeah. all the time. Yeah, um. Does it feel foods. to you like not drinking? But having these, what is like that substitution like for you to have that in, instead of like not drinking alcohol? No, I wouldn't. I don't even classify them in the same thing. I mean, these are delicious. But it, I mean, in the sense of like just having something in your hand more or less, because like I feel like that's a part of the <sighs> thing of not drinking too. And like my only relationship to that is like when I got pregnant and was like, oh, I can't drink anymore. Okay. What do I do with my hands for a second? It feels like a little bit awkward. And then I would either have a pop or tea or whatever. But like, does it feel like that to you? Uh, maybe to a degree, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't really put them in the same uh, category as like... Uh, like, I don't even think of it as, I don't think of it as like a substitute for alcohol. That's why a lot of people would tell you, I, I heard a guy saying that like, yeah, those are bad. Like anything that's like a, uh, like a substitution is like a bad thing because it leads you to stay in the habits and you're trying to like break a habit, whether that be like cigarettes or like whatever. Mm -hmm. And nothing is one size fits all for everybody. So, uh maybe it would be a bad idea for somebody but i like them they were actually they're like my only thing that i do that's like a ritual of like uh like i don't go to AA or nothing that kind of shit's not for me i don't like i don't journal or go to therapy or groups or do this or that like i don't i don't really do anything as far, but uh, I just, for me, it's just like, hey, you want to drink? Nah, I'm good. I don't think. Yeah. Like, no, that, you've that's been it. a champ. It's that simple. It's crazy uh, how it's so different. What for I was saying people. was the, the only thing that I do is like, I always, I make it a point to go grab these athletics as long as I can find them. If not, fine. You can always find some brand. Oh, dude. But the athletics are the best because you can get them at Whole Foods. So, now I hit, now I'm like Brian and I hit Whole Foods before every show <laughs> and uh, get like food for the night. And uh, I pick up the athletics before the show. I keep them cold. And it's what I drink after a match. So I used to like get some type of alcohol, cold beer, or like just start or get on whiskey or whatever. Like pretty soon after a match, you know, it's just like habit, like forever. Uh, but I, I go out of my way to make, like, I don't need to, it doesn't really serve any purpose. I mean, they're, they're nothing. They're just like drinking water, but I go out of my way to do it because it's like a ritual. 
it, then it's like kind of like 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 cold beer at the end of the night after a match where you're like yeah that ruled and you're all sweating and pulling blood out of your eye or whatever and high-fiving and talking about the match and drinking the beer kind of puts a button on the end of the night or whatever so like that's kind of my like okay this is the button on the end of the night yeah but uh for me the purpose that it serves is it like remind it's a giant uh blinking reminder that like i don't want to forget that like you know you're not supposed to be drinking right right that would be what me would be like i just forgot right kind of it's almost like, uh, here, let's have a drink or have a shot. Yeah, like, like it would that. be everything was going. It wouldn't be like, oh, everything sucks and I'm depressed, so I'm going to go drink. It would be everything is going so good and everybody's happy and whatever. And I just kind of like, yeah, whatever, yeah, sure. And then I, before I knew what I was drinking, I don't want that to happen. So I go out of my way to like, I have my little six pack of non-alcoholic beers. It's like my little thing because it's a giant blinking reminder that you're not drinking because a non-alcoholic beer is such a ridiculous thing to drink. And it's so hard to go out of your way to find a whole foods before the show <laughs> and find these very specific things. And like, if somebody asks you like, what are you drinking? And you gotta go, let's look at a non-alcoholic beer. Like, so it's this, it's this giant blinking reminder that you're not drinking. Uh, so if, so I won't be, I won't like accidentally slip into an old habit of just like hanging out at the bar or whatever. Or, like, yeah, sure. I'll just like give me a shot. Everybody else is doing one. No, no th- I, I do this. This is what I do. This is my thing. Yeah. This, I, it's like a very, uh, it's the one thing I do that's like, okay, this is my ritual to keep me on track. Mm-hmm. It got, it ended up that way somehow. I kind of realized it was kind of that. And then I went, you know, that's this, but you know, everything, there's a million different, uh, mm-hmm. Again, nothing is one size fits all for anybody as far as uh, whether you're getting off, whether you're stopping, smoking, drinking, drugs, uh, even like something like uh, poor diet, you know, and trying to get off sure. junk food oh or, yeah. yeah, I don't know how, you know, probably um, okay. a whole nother conversation with like sex addicts. They probably got all kinds of, you know, lots of tabs open, I'm sure. Trouble. Yeah. Not how to, to deal with that fun. but yeah every you know just fine you know that's the thing that works for me as far as like like it really uh it's really enjoyable you know, I, like, yeah you know, i actually like, enjoy having it's like my, there, you know, i like i like you know like routines and stuff you know it's like a good uh yeah i got a whole freaking routine now so okay i didn't think when we i didn't think that we were going to start the show and like just get into like that this was i like- didn't even know we started you just like before i knew it, we were starting <laughs> I know I kind of and it kind of feels weird because I haven't done an interview in like a well long I know but that's time. what I was gonna and say you just, you, before I knew it we were recording and then you're just like so tell me about let's just get like I, did not. I talk did about you're drinking non-alcoholic beer gotcha interview is what this is but I didn't so this is like a weird interview for me too because first of all you are always my hardest interview of all the people I've interviewed. You are the toughest person for me to interview because I know all of your shit. Um, you don't like to talk about a lot of things. And since the last time you were on a lot of very personal things have happened. It's been like, God, look at, okay. So it was just Nora's birthday. It is crazy to think of like Nora was born to like where we're at now a whole year that has passed and like the things that have gone on in that year i mean from a professional standpoint i mean what a year you've had i mean pretty much your entire time with aew has just been like bucket list bucket list bucket list like you're doing so many amazing great things but then on the other side of things you're having these other like personal things that went down and then having that be like so public and then bouncing off of those things. So anyways, this is like a weird interview for me too, because I'm not really sure where we're going to go with this, what we're going to talk about, all of those things. Well, I feel like is, this is like a therapy session. This is going to be a test then for you. <laughs> see, see what I'm see made she's of. She's got it. <laughs> see if she's a pro. Let's see what she's let's made of. She's okay, well, we started talking that. about the non-alcoholic beer, so I guess let's just stick with that. Well, and let's then... just talk about what you're just talking about, because it's been a very uh, strange year yeah it's been a crazy year like 
everything is different than it was a year ago than it was six eight months ago yeah yeah i'm in a totally different headspace we live in a different place now we have a, a child which is wild we didn't have a child before god she's cute now though, we have huh? this strange creature crawling around the house that's now obsessed she's with you starting to do little steps she may walk in any minute yeah it's 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 wild this is probably the best so far it's a pretty good year like so far but it's it hasn't really been i kind of said something about it like the other day like yeah you said it in a promo you're know, like people don't really know what know, just, it's you know, been like for you it's live and i got like two minutes and i don't know what i'm saying and i'm just kind of like uh just so you know i was like it kind of hit me in the moment i was like yes it's been a weird year yeah. And then I'm like, I snap back into it, like, oh, I'm on TV. Like, you know, anyway, finish promo. Uh, and it, uh, like, uh, dealing with, like, I thought, like, when I stopped drinking, it'd just be like, oh, okay, I'm just going to feel like a million dollars and yeah. just, f- it. but it doesn't work like that when you've been, uh, Drinking and using drugs to, you know, excess more or less going on, you know, like 18 years. Your body. Yeah, but you've not been on drugs, though, just to like clarify. Well, I mean, and not me, but anybody. You know yeah, I mean? yeah like, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just making or whatever clear. it is. You know what I mean? You're, yeah. uh, you know, your, your body needs time to like adjust. You know what I mean? So, like, uh, it's been. When I first uh, wrestled again, so I came back in January, and it was weird. Like, uh, just being in the ring was weird. It felt strange. Like, I came back and did a promo, and that felt great because I didn't have to do anything physical. I just got chalk. But I was, like, super relaxed, like, as if I was just talking – I was more relaxed there than I am now. Really, it's sitting in this seat. So my first match back, you think it's just gonna be like, oh, okay, well now you're sober, so you're just gonna feel like a million dollars. But it doesn't really work like that. And like, I was weird. It was like my legs were in quicksand. I didn't have any adrenaline. Not that I didn't have any adrenaline so much as like I wasn't nervous or like, I, and it's hard to put into words, but it used to be like this big, long, giant process to get ready to go out and do a match or wrestle. It's like this transformation to to be ready to go to the ring. Yeah, it's like this long process of getting it to warming up and feeling better and pouring water on your head and hydrating or whatever to like transform from like how you woke up in the morning to like being in the main event that night is like this. And I think people who probably don't, uh, you know, spend their lives, you know, like partying too much or whatever, probably like don't realize or probably take for granted just waking up in the morning and feeling good. Right. Cause to me, it's like still almost like a, I feel like I'm cheating. Mm-hmm. Like the novelty hasn't fully worn off. Of like not having a hangover. Yeah. Yeah. Just like waking up and being like, okay. Like, I don't have to worry about like being massively dehydrated or where, you know, feeling like crap or whatever. Like for me, it's almost like, oh, I got like a cheat code or something, you know? Uh, anyway, but like that first match, I felt, terrible like i just felt like off like it was weird mm-hmm. i can't really explain it like i was just like chemically imbalanced and like it's it was strange and then like it got a little better the next match and the next match i finally wrestled brian at a pay-per-view and we more or less just went to the ring like the first time i ever met him just kind of got in the ring and just wrestled 
And now, then I kind of started feeling my mojo again. Yeah. I was like, but it took me like a month or something. How much like, did that just, scare you to like have that feeling of like, oh my God, am I going to get back to getting that mojo? Like, who is this new person that I am all of a sudden? Oh yeah, it was stressful. I was like, oh no, do I suck now? This sucks. <laughs> right, right. But then, uh, then I started to very quickly got, uh, got my mojo back. So it's somewhere in the middle of that match with Brian, I think. It just like something snap back. It's hard to explain. Stella got her groove. And then it's been like better and better. Now I'm having a pretty good year, man. Having like yeah. a ton of fun. I'm having a bunch of really good matches. Uh, starting to like really put everything together as far as like the style I want to do. The style I kind of even was picturing like three something years ago, like while I was hurt. And WWE after freaking work every night for two months with a torn tricep. Yeah. And I was off. And I've talked about this before. You know, I was like in rehab when I, I re, rehab for the tricep or whatever. When I realized like I wanted to leave and started watching other wrestling and stuff. But even like way back then when I was picturing what I wanted to do and what I wanted to become in the ring, it was, it looked something like, what you're seeing now mm-hmm. all that long ago and it's been a lot so it's been like you know evolving in the ring and constantly trying new stuff and getting better and you can always you know you always keep learning and keep growing well, and keep i don't getting think a better. lot of people do though like i actually want to like give you credit for that because i don't think a lot of people always want to grow and work and try to get better. I think sometimes people think that they like got the keys to the castle and that they have it figured out and you become really stagnant. And I think that's something that you've been awesome at I is mean, not being stagnant. You are not a standstill person. You got to constantly like learning and growing. And I like, mean, you got to evolve, evolve with the business. You see a lot in this business, people who are still stuck in whatever year they were. Yeah that they come from they're stuck in the 80s or the 70s or the 2000s or whatever it is when like the business is totally different than it was even 10 years ago i was talking about this with uh some of the kids and i talked about it a little bit after some of the kids you old man yeah man (laughs) dude but it's wild well they were just asking just like you know just talking to some of these kids that are training like less than a year at the gcw show in new york so i'm like and it kind of hit me while i was talking to them because i'm like i don't really have any answers for anything you know uh you know it's just like experience you just gotta get experience i, I don't know that's my, my answer when people ask me about anything i go i don't know get experience like uh but it was just like thinking man when i because it's one of the things i said to him was like and i'll tell you this there is no one right or wrong answer as far as pro wrestling is concerned to almost anything. Mm -hmm. Everything I said, everything I tell you could turn out to be crap. If somebody tells you this is the way it is and this is the way it needs to be done. And this is right. I was like, they, they might be really smart, but take all that with a grain of salt, Mm -hmm. make your own decisions. uh, Use your own brain, you know, look at the people. What are the people into? What's working? What's not? What, you know? Because uh, I was brought up on a bunch of certain stuff. I think I talk about this in the book, you know, like. Yeah, you had I a was, book come out in this last year? Oh, like, yeah, that's a whole. God, there's so many, like, the layers audio, to the, what this year has been. The like, audio book just came out, and I'm glad yeah. that's over, man. <laughs> I'm so sick of that book. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm too close to it now. Now I'm. I hate it. I never want to read it again. But, uh, you know, I I came up in the Les Thatcher, you know, system of like getting uh, getting caught talking about your match before the show was like a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all about calling the ring like all these kids in the ring two hours before the show talking about their spots. (laughs) Uh, And, you know hardcore wrestling quote unquote or whatever was garbage and all this and that and you know that's how i that I was taught that this is the way you know like the, in a bunch of different a bunch of different things and it turns out all that stuff is uh and in wwe they tell you a lot of stuff you got to do this and this and this you know mm-hmm. this is the way it needs to be done 
and it's there's all this stuff that's just wrong this is like totally wrong and is demonstrably wrong now with AEW on a national level you know what i say oh you're, word. you're doing too much or whatever you're like you're not selling grab a hold you know all this shit yeah like, like there's so many matches i have now that like i know if that i literally couldn't do in wwe mm-hmm. vince would just flip his lid like yeah uh like i think after for instance like i don't know off the top of my head like me and eddie versus the young bucks great match guarantee you vince would hate it he'd be like oh you're not selling you're doing too much here right? or whatever uh, Les would probably hate it, you know, for similar reasons. So, you know, there's so much stuff that, you know, that because there's so many different styles, yeah. you know, things in Japan work that, you know, somebody would look at and go, that's stupid. That doesn't make sense. But in the, in the universe of Japanese psychology, it works in yeah. the, in the, context of deathmatch psychology some stuff works there's like all kinds of God, different i really want to do a podcast with you that's all on deathmatch psychology uh well yeah i mean okay. and that you know that's it there's all these different and lucha has got its own thing mm-hmm. uh in the i mean think of like in the in the universe of wwe santino's cobra <laughs> yeah. could knock knock a 300 pound man out cold and people believe it and know it, and it's part of that construct. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, there's no no right or wrong, and you know, you can take from everybody, but you know, don't let don't let anybody tell you this is the way. Just keep learning. You know, this is what I told yeah. them. But I was thinking when I was, I was like, man, when I come came up, like this kind of show didn't exist. I mean, it might have existed somewhere. There were like the uh the more popular trendy indies that were you know selling a lot of videotapes or dvds or uh you know with guys with some internet buzz or whatever you know there were those around you know like iw mid south or cw or whatever but uh you know but most indie shows generally like when i was coming up were like like wrestling's changed so much it was almost like a it was just like, okay, something's going on in the town. You know, yeah. Flyer the town, and it's like a bunch of people. They might be kind of wrestling fans from watching WWE on TV. It might be people just going like, what's going on in the town tonight? And it was like, you had to go out there and like... Yeah. Uh, get them to buy into whatever. You go out there and be like, I'm a bad guy, this town sucks, and then come out and and they weren't necessarily super educated, passionate wrestling fans, you know? And there was almost like this adversarial relationship that like, like we're trying to con these marks out of money, quote unquote, you know? And, uh, sure. no, it's your <laughs> and uh, you know, that relationship even existed in WWE a lot at times where, yeah. you know, this conflict between the product and the fans, it's weird, but, uh, there's so many shows now, like the GCW audience, the AEW audience, I think on the whole is like this too. Uh, Defy wrestling, like mm-hmm. all these places where, I mean, I'm talking about this type of specific indie show where like you can, where like it's almost more like a concert where everybody comes and they know the band and they know their songs and they come to have a good time and they want it. You want to they see wa- the They want to be there. Like a, yeah. like a Defy or GCW is more like going to a concert, you know, in a lot of ways than like, it's not like a bunch of people who are like, all right, what, what is this wrestling stuff we're watching? Yeah. No, they're like super passionate wrestling fans and they watch everything and they know who everybody is and they understand wrestling on such a deeper level than uh, fans on a general indie show and us first coming up, like, it's so different it's so awesome and it's such a pleasure to be on a show like that i'm like man some of these freaking kids don't even know how good they got it now like this is so awesome just to have such a good relationship like it's such a pleasure to wrestle in front of those fans and i'm not trying to be like some kind of uh you know not trying to be corny 
when I say it, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. Like, I think a lot of the mainstream's stereotypical feeling of a wrestling fan would be, would be something that's not what it actually is. And wrestling fans on the whole today are so smart and so educated and so passionate as much as anything like uh, fans of music Star or Wars. movies or yeah. comic books and, uh, you know, the kind of people that say like, oh, there's a bunch of nerds or whatever. It's like, no, they're just smart and passionate and uh, <laughs> off. Like, it's a really <laughs> yeah. stupid way to and look at off. Like, yes. uh, but it, it's no different than, yeah. you know, comic books or movies or anything yeah. that people are passionate about. Yeah. You know? and, like, you, I'm one of these fans. Yeah. So we all just get to do this together. And, uh, you know, I, Lately, I uh, I never read a bunch of comic books, like a ton of comic books before. You were in the weeds with them something now. Something hit me in the last few months where I was like, you know, wrestling can be, wrestling is its own category, and it's just wrestling. Some people call it performance art, and then some people get really offended when you call it performance art. Some people say it's sports. Some people say it's entertainment. Some people say it's sports entertainment. To me, there's no one word it's like too impossible to categorize it's just it's wrestling right but there is elements of music uh there's elements of movies there's elements of comedy there's comedy there's, there's, i mean sometimes it's very much like uh you can compare a show to a concert you can compare it to a movie you can compare stories lines to movies or you can compare stuff to albums or you get there's so many different comparisons you can make in entertainment but one thing that i think is it's real similar especially with the fan base is comics uh i never read a ton of comics i used to read like graphic novels being like a, which is like a bunch of comics in an actual book because i used to get them from the library when i was a kid that have like a beginning and an end, but comics just kind of keep going on and on and on and on like soap operas. But with this Kindle now, <laughs> I read something on Kindle and then I realized you could just read these comic books on Kindle and it's pretty cool because you can just close up on them on and read on every picture and every little word bubble and stuff. And it's really hard to stop reading them because I spent so much time reading in the airport or whatever on a plane. And like when one ends, it's like a dollar ninety nine to keep the story going. So I just keep going and going yeah. and going, and then I'm super in the weeds with it. And it occurred to me uh, that like wrestling is so much like the comic book universes because there's you know beloved characters that, uh, and it can go any number of ways. You know, like one character might get brought in as a villain for a one off, but then quote unquote get over and then he ends up being a baby face with his own comic book line right and they might turn heel and go back baby face and then they might some of them might team up uh you might do something like forbidden door is going to be almost like a crossover series between yeah. like dc and marvel or something sometimes you just have like full resets sometimes like some characters are like you know like dick grayson was robin and then he became nightwing it's almost like changing gimmicks, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. somebody would, uh, he was mean Mark Callis and then he became the undertaker. Right. Like, so there's so many comparisons between that war and the fans. I mean, go to, you ever been to a comic con? Holy shit. You know, it's the, <laughs> okay. It's you're, the same you're amount really of like going, you're, you're going off the, you're going off path a lot. What path? We'll we're have talking about wrestling. Well, I know, but we want to talk, we'll have other things to talk about too. What you got? You got somewhere to be? No, I just. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Ladies, sweaty sack summer is approaching, and it's time for you to prioritize the comfort of your man's family jewels. Now, a sponsor of today's episode, Manscaped, they have spent two years designing the most comfortable boxer briefs out there for the men in your life. Um, I've had the honor of testing out these new boxers, and I can say. 
It is the softest fabric of any underwear and perfect loungewear for your night in or for sleepwear. They even trademarked the jewel pouch, which is kind of adorable. Let his bulge breathe and get 20% off plus free shipping by using the code Renee at manscaped.com. So this, of course, is thanks to their Lawnmower 4.0, the best electric trimmer for below the waist grooming. This trimmer offers skin safe technology designed to trim hair on loose skin, his balls. Outside of just ball trimming, they're now focusing their efforts on making your man as comfortable as possible with game changing boxers. These boxers features includes the jewel pouch, a pouch that's designed to cradle your future children in their own special place, lined with perforated performance fabric to keep them well ventilated. We wanna keep everybody breathing good, clean, fresh air. Um, And the micro modal fabric is buttery, soft, and breathable, keeping his cucumber cool. And you can choose from an arrangement of designs, the colors and sizes range from small to triple XL. For all my guys out there, we want everybody covered. We want your junk to be in the best hands possible. So for you to get 20% off plus free shipping with the code Renee, that's R-E-N-E-E at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code Renee at manscaped.com. Now, once the Boxers 2.0 touch his sack, he'll never go back. Wow. Uh, yeah, like uh, I guess I was saying earlier, you know, it uh, you know, it was hard at first coming back. The first match I had, I felt terrible. The next one felt a little better. Finally, kind of started to get my mojo back. And on top of that, I got hurt. Yeah, I hurt my uh, hamstring. People, people little... don't know you got hurt, right? No, because it was. I didn't need to stop wrestling. I just taped my uh pulled my hamstring really bad but it prevented me from you know really training a lot and kind of prevented what i could do in the ring uh so i couldn't do a lot of like running around or anything i would be too much running anyway but uh didn't really affect me all that much i got through it you know but everybody you're always hurt in wrestling yeah you're never like a hundred percent i haven't really been close to a hundred percent especially like mentally or mentally or physically since i've been back yeah yet it's still been like a really good year yeah it, it's crazy though like how that kind of ebbs and flows too where like there are those ups and those downs and physically mentally all of those things kind of coming together but okay let's let's take it back to like the beginning though of you going into rehab what was your head space leading up to that night sweats the night sweats are You've the after the effect. Sweats. The night sweats are. F- I've never seen crazy anything like night it in sweats, my life. Crazy nightmares. My chemicals are all imbalanced. Yeah. Wacky mood swings. You can attest to all that. You know. True. So you know, yeah, when I no, say it hasn't been easy, you know, like the not drinking part is easy. I don't have like. It's not like I have some desire to drink. I have no desire to drink. It's I can't even. I can't even imagine drinking right now. Like, yeah. It's just a, so beyond like like that the not drinking is easy we'll stop drinking yeah i wanted to stop drinking for a long time i was trying to quit drinking for a long time mm-hmm. just the uh dealing with all the after effects of what happens to you physically when your body goes through this crazy yeah metamorphosis trying to re like recalibrate itself yeah has not been easy you know so and i'm doing i'm on national television while i'm going through these problems you know it's actually so like, it's like in front of yeah. everybody it sucks i mean a lot of people in my position would have been uh would have stayed in rehab a lot longer uh would have stayed in hiding a lot longer you know, yeah. i was three months later i'm sure like a lot of the people there like the doctors or therapists or whoever were probably like the one therapist chick had straight up told me to retire yeah <laughs> she was like start a wrestling school train some kids she's like you know what the problem is you gotta get out of there i was like i don't think it's that but i mean i was on i went in on halloween night and i was back on tv in january yeah so uh but it that it's been great you know but i'm just saying you know it's great but there are those ups it makes those me downs. a little self-conscious you know sure kind of, uh 
feel like everybody's staring at me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, I also I kind of don't give a f- That was a big part about uh, going to rehab was kind of the uh, the relief of it. Mm-hmm. That like now there's nothing to hide. Kind of figure I didn't know how people's reactions was going to be like if people you had your phone off for a really long time too months yeah uh, yeah you were in airplane mode for a long time that was great so when you first go into rehab they uh take your phone and uh after which sucked for me yeah, I had to after, wait for you to like call me from a pay phone every day yeah there was like a little community pay phone thing you can and use there so i call it good thing i remembered your number honestly right uh, <laughs> information but uh they take your phone and after however long of you know good behavior they'll eventually give it back to you so you can have your phone in rehab so one day they called me to the front and they're like it's like what's the problem and they're like uh you can have your phone back it's been enough time or whatever and i'm like huh and I was just feeling really good about everything. It was like so happy not having a phone that I was like, ah, and I made a weird face. And she's like, you don't have to take it. We can just keep it here and locked up if you want. And I was like, you just keep it. Yeah, and, I, and I went back the whole rest of the time. Yeah. Even when I left and went home, when I went into rehab, I lived in Vegas. When I got out of rehab, I didn't live in Vegas anymore. Well, talk about going like <laughs> so you I didn't, just went straight to the airport. You yeah, you didn't even you could, didn't even book your ticket on your phone. Like you went to yeah, the I front had, desk. I had you, the desk. as you know, uh, at her. Did I book your flight? Yeah, I had her book oh, me a it. ticket. <laughs> Good memory on me. And I just went to the airport. Yeah, I just went to the airport, old school, with my ID and no phone. I had my phone, but I turned it off. I just, I like one, even when I got out, and I didn't turn on my phone. And I didn't turn it on for a long time. And I realized like how great it feels. The freedom like the that air movie. is sweeter, sounds and sights and everything are are better. Like and you don't have a you don't have a TV. Uh maybe some rehabs do. Where I was at, you don't have a TV. So it's just a room with a bed in it and a chair, a bathroom, and there's no TV, you know, or anything, no radio, no phone no computer nothing you know there's like a little library where you can read books and take them back to your room that's about it so it's a whole and your sleep is all messed up Mm -hmm. sleep is really hard to come by there and it's still hard for you to sleep and you're up you know at seven in the morning you start all the activities and stuff you know so sleep is really hard to come by and they come burst in your room like every hour to make sure you're not dead uh so there's a lot of just sitting there staring at the ceiling, staring at the wall, you know? Mm-hmm. But it was great. Being disconnected eventually felt so great. I like, bet. Pretty quickly. Yeah. But I was like, I don't want to go That's back. That's a detox I don't we wanna... all need shit. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And people couldn't fathom it. A lot of people couldn't fathom not being like tied to their phone. But like we didn't have cell phones till how long ago, you know? Yeah, yeah. We went a I long mean, time. People lived them. for a long time before phones were invented. You can do it. I promise. Let's you. talk about before you went into rehab. Like what was the buildup and for you, I guess like the breaking point or realizing like I have to go and get help. I mean, you said a second ago that like you wanted to quit drinking. It was something you were trying to do and wanted to do, but you you had to go to rehab. Uh yeah, like it wasn't a thing of uh, nothing bad happened. Yeah. I didn't total car. Yeah, I, I want to make that clear on my end too is that right. like, yeah, nothing ever. I think people thought like maybe something went down. Yeah, I didn't just like, go to no. jail, nothing. Just like, I just couldn't stop. Mm-hmm. I was trying for the, like the longest time, which sounds stupid. You, if you don't know, you just go, just stop drinking. Here's the thing too that I think that I didn't really know until I started dealing with this, but uh, but I don't know if you never had to really look into it, you just might not know, is uh, if you just stop drinking, if you drink a lot, you can die. So the fir- first problems that, 
where like the whole th- like I mean, I've always drank. Yeah. Drink a friggin' drink beer all night back in the day, whatever. Friggin' wake up, sleep two hours, go out, wrestle twenty five minutes. Oh, you were like a high functioning alcoholic, yeah. Yeah, I was just after the show, just get mm-hmm. up. You know what I mean? Wake up the yeah, next, wake up the next morning, sleep, sweat it out. And, Never yeah. had any problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's and some... like the nicest <sighs> drunk person too, like just like sweet and chatty, just want to hang out. Yeah. Uh, at some point, it was literally the first time I tried to stop and I was experiencing uh, for the first time alcohol, at least that I remember, alcohol withdrawal. Uh which is as bad as withdrawal from just about anything. And it's dangerous and a lot more dangerous in a lot of ways. Uh, the first thing that they, they told me this and that they're like, yeah, just quitting drinking cold turkey, you know, at a certain threshold, which I was at, it's the worst thing you can do. It's the most dangerous thing you can do. You can just go into cardiac arrest and die. Or what's really common is you have seizures. Yeah. And, uh, Something really bad can happen from that. Uh, that's what happened to Cass. Mm-hmm. There's uh, 12 hours without alcohol in his system, get seizure. So it's like, so I was really worried about that. Uh, mm-hmm. I was terrified of that for the yeah. longest time. So uh, the feeling of it is like, it's like uh, crushing physical anxiety. Like you're like, you know, if you look, you know, it's tell when it's there. I'm like, yeah. like, mm-hmm. uh, not anxiety. Like you're nervous about something. Like f- the physical feeling of anxiety. Like your breathing's messed up. Like you're like twitchy. Like th- they call it the shakes because you know you're literally like shaking. And there are times it'd be like a TV, and I feel like people are gonna think that I'm like on drugs because I'm sober. Right. You know. So uh, like a lot of times we'd be talking to people or doing whatever, I'd like have a little shot or a little flash or whatever, just to mellow out, just to be normal. Cause I'd be like, people are going to think that I'm on crack right now just because I'm sober. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, it was like, so I was leveling myself out for like the longest time and that gets really tiring. Yeah. And, uh, so like every night, especially like TVs was like the longest days because I'd be having this like horrible, like alcohol withdrawal at TV. And I'm just terrified that I'm going to have a, I was, I was terrified. I was going to have a seizure on live TV yeah. or on a plane. And like a plane would have to land. Makes me sick to think so to avoid that. that happening on a plane, I would just, I, always i would never be at an airport on a plane without being nicely buzzed yeah. like but a lot of times i'd be like if i didn't have time to like hit the bar before i get on the plane or it's like morning or the bars are closed or something you know whatever i'd just be sitting on the plane like come on with the cart come on come on with the drinks like yeah because uh, i'm yeah. like i didn't know that about I the mean, planes i knew that with the other stuff yeah, but I, I never thought about that i was real I was, planes. yeah i was real scared of I was really scared of like something catastrophic like that happening, you know? So I just kept myself level for like the longest time. And it's funny too. Like once you're in rehab and you talk to all everybody there is like, it's funny how much more comfortable you are around a bunch of addicts and ups. Cause everybody's like, Oh, you think that's bad? Like the story (laughs) you're most embarrassed about. You think that's bad. I once did this or this hat and you go, Oh, that happened to me too. It's funny listening to everybody, everybody else that has like a story about like, how they tried to wean themselves off where they go like, Oh yeah, I'm just going to drink beer. Or I'm just going to drink wine or I'll just do a little Bailey's in the morning or everybody like tries to like wean themselves off slowly, which you can do, but it's really bad idea. Uh, so, uh, smoked a lot of cigarettes in rehab. Hey. There's nothing else to do. Everybody like yeah. in between the classes or the groups or whatever, everybody just goes outside and smokes. So like, if you didn't smoke cigarettes before you went in, you will when you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was I at? Yeah. So I was like really worried something like that was gonna happen, and I just like it was getting 
I was just so exhausted with it because everything has to like revolve around staying level and like I couldn't just like I couldn't enjoy wrestling because I was just wanted to I was so worried about that and battling you know, all day because like you can't go on TV and wrestle f-ed up mm-hmm. so I had to be like sitting there worried going through withdrawal where you know it's so, like as soon as I got done like it's like this big wave of relief like oh, okay I got through another day got through another TV and didn't have a seizure and die on live TV sweet so I immediately start getting loaded because now it's been however long with it so and then you just end up drunk again <laughs> So yeah. it's like this never ending cycle of hell. Like it was, there was like months. There was absolute, absolute hell. Mm-hmm. I just could like, and I didn't want to, uh, I just, uh, I mean, cause it is embarrassing to a point to have to, that's why a lot of people don't get help when they should. Yeah. Cause you have to admit that like, look, I really, up because it is embarrassing to a point like i'm such an idiot and so stupid i drank myself into a now my body literally can't function without alcohol mm-hmm. it's like embarrassing to admit that like you idiot right. how'd you not know that was gonna right. happen it says on the bottle it's crazy enjoy responsibly happens, yeah though, like the like but, but gradual it, build of it over time over time over time and like it's obviously such a thing that's so prevalent in pro wrestling it's prevalent in tons of other sports and entertainment all of those things but it's like i you get it i mean when i worked with wwe i was drinking a shit ton just because kind of the thing that you do you drink at the airport you drink on the plane you drink when you get to the hotel you drink after the show like it's constantly this cycle that just never ends and that's coming from me who's not taking any bumps at all like i'm not dealing with the physical pain on top of that so yeah, like I can't even imagine. That's another thing that probably ha- probably added to it over the years. I'm not uh, not going to lie and say I've never drank strictly to dull physical pain. I've done it a shit ton. Yeah, I'm working for two months with a torn tricep. You don't think don't think I was getting loaded every night? I was in so much pain all the time. Yeah, that was brutal. Uh, just so much. It's just how you get through i don't know you just get used to it because the thing that sucks is like you know ibuprofen tylenol leave don't do shit i don't even i'll take that shit because it doesn't do anything you know it works alcohol it works if you feel like shit if your neck hurts if you're limping around because you're beat up alcohol works that's why you know yeah (laughs) it's what but it uh it's not a good idea to use it as a uh crutch you know, so, uh, you know, just yeah. saying, you know, so that, yeah. that's probably part of it. But, you know, to me, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like, okay, I'm all stressed out and I have problems. And like, it wasn't like, okay, I need to go to rehab and talk about my feelings. It was, I'm going to die. Like, it was a f- physical problem. I need to recalibrate my whole system. Like, I'm completely. Mm-hmm. so uh you know that can ha- it can happen to anybody man like there's 100%. i don't i don't know what the threshold is but like yeah uh once you start feeling like that uh those withdrawal symptoms be it like alcohol or pills or whatever it is like, like that's when you're in trouble mm-hmm. when you're like doing whatever you're doing to normalize yourself you know that that you know it's a it's a bad slope so know? so the <laughs> night that you had to go in you had come home it was halloween night and that's when it was kind of like okay this has to happen right now yeah, yeah. it all happened and we were moving the next week it was like oh my god everything was happening all at once that was like a f- trip that was nuts yeah like a lot of shit was happening at once like because we were getting ready to move so we're dealing with all that. I was trying to sell a house, trying to buy a house. I'm on the road, a bunch. selling two houses, yeah. dealing with a bunch of crap. And the whole time, I'm just—it's getting really bad, and I'm just trying to stay level. You and know, we have a four-month baby. Yeah, oh, and time. we just had a baby, and I'm like, that's when I first tried to stop. You know, mm-hmm. before she even came, and yeah. then that just made it worse. Like, and uh, so 
yeah, you can't be drunk when you're holding the baby, you know? So it was like obvious before the baby even got here that I was like, you got to fucking stop drinking. Like, and it it was just a lot harder to do. Yeah. (laughs) I thought it would be, uh, it wasn't for lack of, uh, it wasn't Will for lack of wanting, effort. Sure. <laughs> but the way I looked at it that made it easier for me was like, okay, it's not that I'm uh, giving up. I'm just changing my strategy. Like, and somebody uh, at rehab, uh, maybe it was on like a piece of paper. So somebody described it as like, you know, when you're doing that every day, it's like going 12 rounds with a boxer who's just kicking your ass for 12 rounds every day. And you just keep going back and he just keeps whooping your ass again, you know, and you're not going to win because you can't you physically can't. It's just going to keep whooping your ass. It's exhausting. So I, the way I looked at it was uh, I'm changing my strategy. I'm not tapping out. I'm just coming off the stool in the next round with a different strategy. Now we're going to go to rehab. Yeah. <laughs> and now this is how I'm going to win this fight. And I did. I just had to completely, I couldn't do it alone. Yeah. You know, so I, did, I looked at it like that. You know, like if you're losing the battle, sometimes you need to change the weapon or the strategy you're fighting the battle with. You know, yeah. so I went with a different weapon was how I uh, looked at it. How was it for you? Um, no, I mean, I know you weren't on your phone and i mean you're not on social media those are not like a thing that are in your life anyways but knowing that this that it was public information that people knew that that's what happened like as much as that was a worry at first of like why you don't want to do it because mm-hmm. you're like oh i don't want to be known as that i don't want people to look at me as like a f- up or a f- an addict or a drunk or whatever you know i don't want that to like define me i don't want everybody to fuck you know i don't want everybody stick i don't want everybody i don't want to feel weird you know like it's embarrassing to a degree you know so people get their hands on it that's yeah. beforehand but then once i uh i talk talking to you on a little pay phone or whatever so I, I didn't tell anybody like i said it all happened in like 15 minutes like it, it was, was like fast. it was like I could feel the world closing in on me. And I could, I think I knew subconsciously that it was like, it was coming. I know I had, I had this one indie show for Sammy for wrestling revolver. And that was the last show I did. Mm -hmm. But I was like, also I think in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I just got to get through this pay-per-view. Then I'll be clear but I just got to get through this paper or something. It's probably how I was thinking, maybe. But uh, whatever I was thinking. Got through that last indie show for Sammy because I was like, I can't bail on this, you know? They're counting on me. And I think I was just like, I could feel like the world closing in on me because like people were texting me, like, like Eddie texted me like, you all right or something? I'm like, yeah, why? And I'm like, so I knew you were like talking to people. Shout out to Eddie, by the way. <laughs> Eddie was honestly so like was one like, of those people that I checked in. Like, he checked in on me a lot. He was I was starting awesome. to feel like people were noticing whether they were or not. I knew you were. So I was like, no, oh, I was on you. Like I felt like hot. I felt like the world was like closing in on me. Like I just and then. I was in Des Moines. Got a Southwest flight they don't serve booze on Southwest flights for, so for some reason. Well, that was anymore. during like pandemic yeah, times. I guess, yeah. Right? So I knew that. So I was like, well, I'm getting loaded before I get on this plane, three hour flight. So I was like loaded when I landed, came home and like somewhere in there, I feel like you were already like mad at me. Or I don't even know. Like you could just, I could just feel the entire world closing in on me. And I was just like, I cannot go another day like this. I, I I can't go one more day. Mm-hmm. Like this is it's over. And I was just like, it happened in like minutes. Yeah. I was just like, I'm gonna rehab. Like yeah. And you're like, okay. I call <laughs> call the place. I was like, it was Halloween night. I was like, I didn't tell anybody else or anything. And I was just I was standing outside, and like uh, I'm on the God, phone with that them. That was so like giving trippy. them my information, like my credit card information or something. And like uh, 
kids, kids are, are walking up to me while I'm on the phone with rehab and they're like, trick or treat. I'm like, was- give me one second. I'm going to pop a <laughs> Snickers bar in here. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, well, one came here. I'm like, uh, right now. They're like, cool. Call to Uber. It was maybe 10, 15 minutes away from the house. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. An hour after I walked into the door, I was just like walking into rehab. <laughs> it just was like, yeah, it was over. Like and I was probably I was probably in some kind of a stupor, you know, for a minute. But uh what I was getting to with the when people finding out, I don't know what kind of state of mind I was in for the I didn't I felt really defeated for like the first day, just like really defeated. But then I got on a little payphone thing with you and you were like, I was like, what's the deal? And I think you talked you said, Yeah, I talked to Tony and like Mega and everything's cool. They just want to know how you want to broach the subject because, like, I was advertised for a match. So they're like, do you want to tell people or? uh, It's not like you were going to be off for, like, a weekend. You were going to be off, off, obviously, for, like. Yeah, or do you want to just say, like, it was up to me. It was like, we can. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Uh, I mean, I guess. I mean, I'm not going to lie. But they can also just say a personal reason. Uh, But I don't lie and but like uh i was like i guess just tell the fucking truth right and you're like i guess and i went it was exactly what i said to you i said tell him to say whatever the he wants and you're like okay no him i've been it. you know i was like tell him tell him say whatever the he wants. i don't care and you're like cool and then like the next day i talked to you on a little phone and they're like yeah they just like everybody knows and I was like, oh, yeah, there's okay. like some freedom with that almost. Right. Really? Huh. Everybody knows I'm in rehab now. And like, I don't have a phone. So like, I'm not like, I don't know what the reaction is or anything, but I knew it was out there. And then like, I think I went into like some class or group or speech or something next. Like I went into some room with people and I remember just bopping in there like, feeling really good like a weight had been lifted off my shoulder i just went oh f- everybody knows yeah because this thing is this thing i've been hiding and yeah. trying to hide from people for so long mm-hmm. that once there's like oh everybody knows and f- i don't care i remember like, feeling uh, the same way too <laughs> yeah it was just a very much like f- them. i don't care they can call me whatever they want and call me whatever names they want i don't give a shit i'm doing what i gotta do for myself like it was a huge weight lifted off but also like on the other side of that like it was a big relief for me too for people to know that because i had to put a lot of stuff on hold too like i had to put the show on hold for a mix i was like there's no way i can go on and be like hey welcome to the show come hang out and like act like everything was fine so like this show had to be put on hold we were moving we were doing all these things but also like it just felt like so many people were so um like kind about it the people that reached out and want to talk about it and also like how common it is, how many people have been through something like this and whether it's, you know, public information or not, people kind of crawl out of the woodwork being like, Hey, been there, been down that road. So it was actually really nice for me to feel like I didn't have to hide anything anymore. Like the last thing I wanted to do was like, I felt like I was like protecting you in a way during all that too. Like I didn't want anyone to ever think that anything was up. But then to be able to like actually talk to people about it and like, I mean, everybody, it, it really was like a big relief to me. I, it made me feel like a lot less alone. Yeah. I'm like, that does, that makes you, uh, you know, I'll say this too, like if somebody's ever come to that decision, nobody's ever going to get mad at you Mm-mm. for going to rehab. And in fact, everybody will probably be really happy <laughs> yeah. if you take some steps to, uh, fix whatever your problem is because they probably you're probably not doing as good a job of hiding it as you think you are and they'll probably be very happy that you're going to get it fixed whatever that problem is um yeah and i don't want to put any i don't want to put any stress on anybody else like just this is my problem i'll deal with it i didn't ask anything from anybody other than I just didn't show up to work one day. And it was like, and credit to them. Like they were totally, AEW, Tony are like totally cool. If I didn't, he said, if you never came back, that would have been cool. Like, 
Yeah, they, just, were they, they didn't bug me to come. They, you know, when I came back, it was because I just went like, well, I guess I should probably come back now. Everything, you know. Yeah. But and your book back. came out that week too. <laughs> your oh, book yeah, was dropping. Thing. The publishers are calling I, me, and I'm like, uh, uh. I think uh, the book came out like days November after second or something. Yeah. And uh, they <sighs> they had this whole book tour planned out and everything, and I didn't tell them. I just like you disappeared. Yeah. One day, I stopped answering my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and like, so that was another thing I missed. I didn't, I didn't get to enjoy after all the work of the book, which is a lot of work. I didn't get to enjoy any of the spoils of like it coming out and people yeah. enjoying it. And I've been waiting for, I've been excited <laughs> about it coming out to see, hope that people enjoy it. And I didn't yeah. get to enjoy any. <laughs> oh my god, it's so crazy. But it was so that's another great thing because it just took that whole stress off. Because I'm sure they're. You know, you did your I'm work. Sure, it didn't blow the literary world away. You know, so. Well, I think it actually it did actually quite. Oh, well, it's but... smashing success as far as like I've gotten so much positive feedback yeah. from people it's that great. I like that whose opinion really it makes me really happy that they enjoyed it. That mm -hmm. like I I don't think that book could have been more of a success yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no, I agree. It was amazing. Uh, um, okay, let's fast forward. So you you go to rehab, you come back, and now you're here i mean i don't know if, but i guess we can kind of come to like present day where like you're still you know you were saying earlier how just recently you had that promo where you were saying like people have no idea how it's been and like what you've been through but yeah i mean it's it's not just this like go to rehab come back and oh, oh before we even get to that though is uh people were that you saw that comparison of like before you went to rehab to after when you came back and everyone's like, holy shit, oh, look, look at you. Yeah, I look like shit, huh? But it's but it's it's just not that. I mean, yeah, you were a puffy little alcohol. puffy, <laughs> a little puffy. But seeing now where people are like, holy shit, look at this guy. Like, I just feel like that's like, I, I want to talk about that. But also like, yeah, when people are going through some shit, people are going through some shit and people can be really like weird and cruel and judgmental wanting to like, I don't know, talk about people when you don't always know what someone's going through at that time. But anyways, seeing you now, when you like come out, you're shredded, you've got these abs, like you literally look 10 years younger. Well, a lot of people, it actually was starting to annoy me because people be like, oh my God, you look so good. You're in such good shape. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not uh. in good shape. I actually am in shit shape. Uh, Cause I got a really good shape because nothing's, if you are gone for a period of time and then come back to wrestling, nothing replicates actually wrestling for yeah. whatever reason. You can do all the kettlebells, you can do all the sprints, you can do whatever you want. Until you get back in the ring, you're not going to be in ring shape, you know? And uh, dealing with like a hip injury, a leg injury, my chemical balance is all f***ed up uh, in the ring, you know, as far as like, you know, your adrenaline receptors and everything is all weird like one of the mm -hmm. doctors asking me like you know, i was communicating with on the phone they're like yeah how's your anxiety i was like i don't have any anxiety ever uh i would kill for some anxiety actually like you just felt like you were like, so, like i'm going out on live like in that first promo coming out on live to you in front of a sold out crowd and i'm like took like a I, I'm walker. resting heart rate like i'm completely relaxed like yeah. at some point you want a little yeah you know a little, a little adrenaline, jolt. you know, like, uh, well, it's coming back, you know. Uh, what's wait, where am I? What was the question? Um, the question was, I don't remember, I don't remember, I asked you either. I'm um, just getting back into like the groove, of the, they're just like the ups and downs of like dealing with, yeah, being on the other. Oh, oh yeah, what time, yeah. but like people like seeing like the before and after you looking like, oh, you know, yeah, and I was like, shape. I was like, man, I feel weird, chemical balance is all up and dealing with injuries like my training's all up because i have a tiny baby at home and that's hard you know it's just yeah as if just that's not hard you. enough <laughs> like, alone having like a brand new baby and anybody who has and a like, kid knows it's exhausting totally then you add <laughs> all these other layers on it's like oh my god you want to like pull your hair out yeah, and like i'm busy and you're busy and we got this baby we're trading the baby back and forth mm -hmm. you know like it's wild but uh yeah. Oh my god, it it's really crazy. Everyone says like that first year of having a baby like really tests you. And this really was like those like holy shit, like white knuckling it, Jesus take the wheel. 
Yeah, like, it was like, it was nuts. And my mood's been all messed up mm-hmm. and everything. And like having a crying baby when you're like, like chemically imbalanced in the brain, I guess is the only way I could put it. Is like hard, you know. But uh, hey, you know. But it's great. I'm upset. I've become that guy. I'm like obsessed <laughs> with obsessed with my baby. It wasn't at first like a lot of people go. Uh, the first time you ever hold your baby, your whole life. And I was like, okay. And I heard that enough to where I was like, okay, I'm looking forward to that. This should be cool. And uh, held the baby. Nothing. Nothing. Not John. nothing. <laughs> Not nothing. But I it, was, <laughs> it was too surreal. It was like <laughs> it was so surreal. But I'm like, and I, and I was terrified I was going to drop her or something. Well, it, it she was, was, I was, I had my C-section. So you were literally the first person that helped. Yeah, it happened I so was like quick, shaking. You, I had been in labor for 24 hours. Like it was, she was trying to nurse off of you. Yeah, she's trying to suck at my boob. I was like, I don't think that's what you're looking for, man. Uh, but yeah, it happened so quick that it's go <laughs> pull it out of you. Baby. And I'm like, huh? What? It, like, it, it was so <laughs> surreal and you're so scared and terrified and everything for the first few months or whatever well you get the you, and it's like everybody tells you you figure it out you know what to do sure. like your instincts take over and whatever the point was you know six eight ten months or whatever i'm just like oh like now i totally get it like i'm so obsessed with this baby i love her so much mm. i want to puke i know it's disgusting like god i just want it's disgusting her. how much you can love something it's crazy because i'm i get to be madly in love with two women yes like i already have you and now i've made another one of you isn't it the best oh my god but it's crazy because she's actually so much of you she is like you it's so funny how many how much people say that they're like oh your firstborn daughter is your husband and that's nora like the way she reacts when you get home like there's just something so special about that father-daughter relationship like I'm her mom. We have this, you know, we have that mother daughter relationship, but something about that father daughter relationship that is just the, uh, untouchable. The magic. reaction you get from your dogs when you come home is always a really good feeling. When you come home off the road, your dogs freak out, they jump up and they start <laughs> running around in circles, you know, and they always do that. I still got that, you know, but now it's like doubled because now I get the baby pop. Mm. The baby pop is it's a good pop. It feels good. <laughs> she <laughs> just for people watching on YouTube. So John got home the other day and he got dropped off in an Uber. And her and I are sitting on the lawn. And he was like like 20 yards away. She saw you and was like, ah, 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 ah. sees you. Her hands go straight up because she wants John to come pick her up. Like that's her big thing is the hands go up to come get me, come get me. The reaction she has to seeing you just like, oh my God, it melts my entire body. Yeah. I die. I'm totally that guy now where I'm like, look at pictures of my baby. Check it out. <laughs> and they're like, nice picture. But I'm like, oh no, we're going to scroll through them all. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> yeah. like, but there's so many other people like that. I have text conversations with people that basically we just send pictures of our babies to each other <laughs> like people who have the babies know that like i need somebody to show us picture to and you're gonna look at it oh my and, god you know you're just volume back and forth you know yeah i feel like a bunch just, of people oof. had babies like all around the same time yeah you know? and, uh, it's nice it is nice to have so many friends that all have yeah. like babies and we can all just like From yeah group chat comparison you know <laughs> group chat those little chickens oh my god they're just the best um Okay, coming up on Sunday, Forbidden Door. Um, you said you are the Forbidden Door. There's been a lot of Forbidden Doors happening. What yeah. is um? What's your perception of the Forbidden Door? I really am over that term myself. Mm-hmm. Everybody's using it. You know, Tanahashi actually coined it, but now it's not forbidden anymore because now there's a nice little working relationship. So the door is not forbidden. Uh, anymore he's gonna have a little code a little but yeah key it's card definitely to get in. in the lexicon now uh, yeah there are forbidden doors but there does not exist one between AEW and new japan it did however a couple years back and like the thing with me of like a joint show of dream matches between AEW and new japan is like 
Well, I've been in New Japan for three years and I've been in AEW for three years. I've been in both like yeah. the whole time. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, so kind of different for me. The thing is like, uh, they weren't, you know, the relationship was not good, you know, between, it has nothing to do with me. And so that's probably why I was a really good guy to help bridge the gap because it had nothing is not my business, not my problem at all. Mm -hmm. I was out of WWE and available and I want to work for New Japan. I want to try his AEW too. Let's just fucking try it all, man. And I'll do whatever the I want. So I was a good, like neutral party, I think, to help bridge the gap over yeah. the last few years. Cause I love both for it and owe, owe so much to both companies. Uh, and you know, they're, but you know, the whole time, I mean, I signed like a little six month contract from like my first match to the Tokyo Dome uh, with New Japan. I signed that before I signed with AW. Right. You know, so I've been there this whole time. Yeah. And I kind of figured a bunch of people would be doing that well, too. You knew you, you really know? wanted to go to the G1 too, like immediate. That was like- Yeah, and like I didn't know how, I didn't know how it was gonna yeah. work out for me anyway. I mean, it was all like, and who knows what's gonna happen, but it worked out so good in both places, you know? Yeah. And the whole time, and then I kind of learned that like, the relationship is not good and uh but i'd be in the middle and i have been a vi so i'm proud of this forbidden door pay-per-view going on because i've been such a proponent of we should have some kind of relationship going on together like there's there's no re that's just stupid like there's yeah. so many benefits to that and for me the benefit wasn't even so much like oh let's do a big super show and it and it's not like okay we have to be married and in bed together mm -hmm. because it's two different products on two different continents with two different fan bases two different business models two di you know everything just two different products entirely mm -hmm. but there's a lot of benefits to just you know having an open door policy of communication to be like like i was saying years ago like 2019 2020 i was being like yeah, like we have, because we have all these young guys. I mean, you know, we don't have a like a house show schedule or anything or whatever. And like they need to get experience and get better and get good. And, you know, a lot of times you just want reps and you want to try stuff yeah. out. You yeah. know, we don't have like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then do the show Monday for TV. You know, we just, just have TV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for a lot of these young guys, I was like, we should be sending like Darby to Japan. And I get it that you don't want him to get hurt because you're paying him. And for example, you know, Darby. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I get him that he's your guy and you pay him. You don't want him to get hurt. And you also probably wouldn't want to put over everybody in Japan. But at the same time, who sent him over there? Who gives a shit how many matches he wins, how much he's, how many matches he loses? Just let him go. Send him, let him do the super juniors. Like I was saying that years ago yeah. and we just got wheeler into the super yeah Junior. me and regal and brian and uh wheeler are all sitting there and we're blackpool combat club the bcc yeah <laughs> sitting there having a training session and you know wheeler says something about like yeah I, if my visa comes through like might be able to do super juniors but it was on the same day as uh the AEW pay-per-view mm. and he's an AEW talent but we, all three of us, me, Regal, and Ryan, were like, go. Hunt, like, 100%. It's not even a question. Ten matches against, like, the top junior heavyweights in the world or one match. Yeah. Like, you're a, a young dude who we need to build into something better than you are. You're, the experience you gain from that is going to, who gives a shit what his record is at the end of the tournament? Like, yeah. we were all like, go. And, like, that was more along the lines of what I was thinking trying to get this relationship together and like also like things like you know if we need just a little extra spice for pay-per-view maybe we bring over a tanahashi or an okada or something mm -hmm. and, you know put him over against one of our guys like, like a younger guy and it'd be a big match for him and he learns and whatever or like maybe uh you know we send young guys over there we send the big guys over to tokyo and i don't know whatever like case by case basis sure. but it'd just be really good to have that open door you know and uh it was hard working in like 2020. It was hard working for both because there was no communication. 
and I'd have to talk to Japan and then go back to AW and try to like make all everything work out together as far as like the schedule and the booking and everything. It was hard. Yeah. Like, Cause there was no, there was no help. Stressful. Like I was doing it all on my own. And uh, there were got there were plenty of people that told me to stop working for new Japan mm-hmm. that did not understand it. That were like, you should stop going there. And I knew that I was like the last linchpin. If I was like the last domino, if I fell, that would like, then there'd be no communication ever. Cause there's so many people on both sides that were agreeing with me. Yeah. Yeah. It just didn't open the communication. I think like when that Harold guy got fired from New Japan, I think that kind of opened it up a little bit or whatever. Now there's like, like the first, when they started doing those LA tapings, you know, during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, that's a four hour drive from Vegas where we live at the time. Like for sure, I'll go like defend my US belt at those, you know? So I had to work that out because that's in uh, AEW territory in the US. So I had to like work that out, but that was a bitch to get worked out. And then got a little better. And then we brought Kent in and me and Kent did part of our angle on AEW TV. Mm-hmm. I brought Nagata in because I was going to go wrestle Nagata in an empty building and I was telling Tony <laughs> yeah. and he was like well shit why don't you do it on dynamite I was like that'd be great you know so Nagata comes in and then and now, now it's opened up to where now there's like a full now if like New Japan asks me something like hey do you want to do this or that I just go ask Tony I'm cool with it yeah like I can just oh, I don't like better. now the pressure's off me to be like in the middle I can just go oh sweet now all I have to do is worry about wrestling so well, so I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of, you know, the, uh, that this is happening, you know, yeah. and there's other relationships that I would like to open up, you know, unofficial, just friendly relationships that I think could be beneficial for everybody with other companies too. You know, and I'm trying, uh, no, because, but you know, things I'm trying to facilitate that's really good for wrestlers in the future mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and good for us and kind of good for everybody and kind of, you know, as much as I can help kind of give back to the business that's given me everything, you know, For and sure. help other guys along, you know. Um, yeah. I think that kind of this Blackpool Combat Club thing is kind of giving me more of an itch to like uh, kind of help people. Like, I don't think I would ever want to be a producer or like an official coach or anything, but, like, you know, I like training with guys, you know, that I think are worth it. And uh, I like learning myself and like, yeah. Uh, you know, we don't have a uh, like an official developmental or anything, you know, but uh, you know, if we have relationships with like other indie companies and stuff, you know, we could yeah. like send young guys there to for experience and stuff. And you know, so if I can kind of, I'm, I'm trying, so I'm working on all that. If I can <laughs> kind of be part of that to kind of help with yeah. that, I could, you know, I could see being, um, being another thing that I'm kind of involved in um how about blackpool combat club coming around at um seemed like a really good time for both you and brian to start working together and then bringing in the addition of regal adding wheeler uh it just seemed like the timing of that to just sort of give you guys a a little like creative juice oh it's worked out so good and uh for a bunch of reasons as far as you know been extremely beneficial to me just and and it's really just fun and awesome and we have such a good relationship and you know train try out moves and stuff and uh have a open group texts where we send videos and stuff back and forth and you know like regals it's just regals he's not an official coach or anything but he does what he always does. He just shows up at the building at like 10, 11 a.m. and yes. works with young guys, whether mm-hmm. they're involved with us or not. It's just, it's so ingrained in him to be a coach. It's just what he does. You know? yeah. So it's hard for me not to kind of get in on that too. And, and it's fun for me. So it's just, it's a thing that's kind of making us all better. It's been great for me and super fun. And the way I look at it is, uh, I mean, the way it all came about, there was not some big plan or anything. It was, uh, I was going to wrestle Brian and uh, so we need a reason for me to wrestle Brian because I was going to wrestle Brian and then I went to rehab because I was drunk, right? So 
That's kind of yes, wrestling. that's what it was. Right. Before. Sorry, I forgot yeah. who, that's what it was. It was Brian right before he went in. Duh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. just it wants to do me and Brian, two big stars. She's doing okay. So we need a reason to wrestle. Uh so Brian said something about like maybe you know I could uh, float the idea of us doing a team to you. But you know that I'm a bad guy, you don't trust me. And I'd done something similar with Jericho where he wanted me to join the inner right oh yeah yeah, yeah. maybe we do that and i'm like yeah but then i get mad that you team with somebody else or something and I, what i don't know just some kind of like reason for us to start having some kind of story so we do this so we go do a promo in the ring and i don't know what brian's gonna say he doesn't know what i'm gonna say brian suggests to me in the ring on tv that we should be a team and he talks about how we could take young guys and mold them and you know you don't have anybody watching your back and we could we could dominate this place well all this stuff that he said in that promo and i was listening to it for the first time in the ring and he made such a compelling case <laughs> and the audience actually was kind of you could tell the audience was going huh okay you know yeah. that actually kind of makes sense yeah. you know it wasn't like jericho and the inner circle were like total bad guy characters like joining them would have been like turning to the dark side brian was making a really good case yeah and it was the people were actually kind of uh reacting strongly to the idea like you know i think he's got a point i'd watch that and then yeah. we were just i was sitting at home i think we were going to the mall or something and i was sitting there thinking about like what we were going to do and yeah you know, yeah and i went you know, sometimes you just got to turn the rock over and see what's underneath there and just go, what if I said yes? You know, like everybody can see it coming a mile away that I don't be like, no, I'm not going to join you, bad guy. I don't trust you. But what if I was just like, okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? And then I started thinking about more and more. And I'm like, it's way more interesting if we do team up. Yeah. And that's so much more TV and so many more stories. Then you the add in like that whatever. regal layer as well. The fact that he became so available I, I, like at that perfect time. I texted Brian and I was like, man, I'm not going to lie to you. I was thinking, what if we did do that? And he's like, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I mean, I don't, you didn't, I can't in real life or as a character, think of a good reason to say no. Yeah. And, uh, He's like, yeah, so we, one of us or both of us talked to Tony and I talked to Tony. He's kind of like, he didn't see the whole vision at first. He's like, yeah, you know, you could do it for a few weeks and then, then break up or whatever. But I'm like, nah, like I, me and Brian both like saw the vision mm -hmm. without even really having to, like, I could tell we both saw the exact same thing. And, uh, I just floated it to, I either floated it to Brian or Tony first. I went like, look, I'm not, I haven't talked to him in a while. Because Regal had just got fired, uh, left and next team. Yeah. And I was like, I haven't talked to him in a while. Uh, I don't know if he's actually available. I don't know if he even wants to work. I don't know what his contractual status is, if he'd even be interested. I'm just fantasy booking. Mm -hmm. But Regal's got this relationship with me. We've got this relationship with Brian. And we're doing this like story right now. He's like the perfect in-between guy. There's got to be something we could like. And I kind of had the vision of him coming in and it was breaking best. up the fracas and, you know, <laughs> all mean, that. those slaps he gave you guys, holy That yeah, was rough, yeah. <laughs> I knew it would be, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of threw that out there and Brian said, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And he is interested and Tony already talked to him and he is available. <laughs> so like they were already thinking the exact same yeah. thing I was thinking before I even <laughs> came up, had to come up with the idea. So like everybody was thinking the same thing and like they had already called him and talked to him. They're like, yeah, he's going to be at the pay-per-view. <laughs> oh, I'm perfect. Cause I was already, uh, oh, you're like, already perfect. Set. And I hadn't yeah. seen him or talked to him till so he, he showed up at a pay-per-view and he was like, you could tell he was like, uh, you know, you get out of WWE and you're kind of shell shocked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's different. It's walking into a different world backstage at AEW, and he was like looking around and like, oh, what's going on? And I was like, dude, it's cool here, man. Trust me. Like, yeah. Just it's gonna be out. If you have like an idea, just tell me, and like we can just do it.
(laughs) there's no writers like i was like this is totally different so that first night he's like "Uh," we're like me and brian and him are just sitting there talking about what we're gonna do a little bit before we go out and there's no writers there's no creative there's no like we just gotta kind of tell tony and as long as he's cool that's cool and he's just this you can tell he's like trying to Wrap you know, around it. Yeah. He probably sold something, told you something like that. It just took him kind of a minute to kind of catch up to what was going on. It all happened so fast for him. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's like, it, and the thing with Wheeler was an accident. Yeah. I was doing a thing where I was like, we're building to uh, me and Brian eventually clashing, right? And uh, I was just mowing through people, right? And I so I wrestled Wheeler and just killed him before uh way before and then uh i'm supposed to wrestle brian kendrick hour before the show uh come in the office that match is not happening uh what are we gonna do we're opening the show show starts in an hour uh a couple of names thrown around tony's like wheeler i'm like perfect wheeler so we go in and have a little match and then it was bef- that was either before or after Brian did the promo. And he's like one of the guys that I think Brian mentioned him by name. And yeah, then it yeah. just like very naturally happened. And then before you know yeah. it, he's in a group. But the people just so truly and naturally got behind him and bought into the story. And it's like, yeah. here we go. And now it's a thing. And I look at it like the, the whole Blackpool Combat Club thing is like, not so much like okay we're at, like i was trying to think of a name for like me and brian's little group or whatever i'm like it's not so much we're a tag team called like we're the flaming blondes or something like and it's us two and we're a tag team Dude, it's more of like a uh, it's more of like an idea like a stamp an association or, uh, like being in the blackpool combat club is like a stamp of getting that stamp of approval it's a badge badge of honor there you go yeah Yeah. kind of almost like the new kind of like in the way the heart dungeon was like sure gives you instant credibility yeah yeah. like any everybody that's been associated with that is somehow kind of associated together Mm -hmm. bulldog owen brett pillman uh all those guys and then that tj and natty and harry and yeah uh and uh like when jericho first debuted in ecw they built him as the last survivor of the heart dungeon because mm-hmm. he had a connection to that so that gave him instant credibility with the audience yeah. you know so it Means so anybody yeah so if me and brian retired tomorrow you could still keep it going you could keep it going for decades you know yeah uh, it's almost like our our final gift to regal right like it's this thing you mm-hmm. know that's why the name is uh more in reference to him and his style and the things he taught us you know yeah. i've never even been to blackpool you know <laughs> so uh and it's it, who knows we're still it's still new so yeah. i mean the the possibilities are endless with it it can keep going forever you know it's pretty cool so it's great um i had googled that or i had tweeted that i love b bb wait bcc <laughs> do you know what bbc is yeah, but, uh, <laughs> walked right into that one. I didn't know. Hey, it was only a matter of time. Somebody was going to do it. <laughs> I had no it idea. I like tweeted it, just yeah. like supporting that. I love it. And like my whole timeline's like the eyeballs, people being like, girl, what? And I like Googled it and I was like, oh. Hey, ah. it's a very easy typo to make. Yeah. 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 Listen, it can happen. Um, okay. So the situation that you were in currently forbidden door happening on Sunday, you and Tanahashi, um, talk to me about the circumstances of this and the opportunity for you to be the first ever two time AEW, uh, world champion. A lot of stuff with me, you know, over the years is, uh, being the right guy, the right place at the right time Mm -hmm. circumstance. And, uh, that's just how it goes sometimes, you know, you gotta be ready to seize those opportunities. You know, very rarely in my career has it been like, okay, he's the guy we're going with. You mean like when you were a WWE champion? 
that's a good example. Yeah, it's yeah. never been like, okay, he's the guy we're going with. We got this all planned out. He's our guy. Let's do it. Only time that ever happened. Okay, this is our guy. This is his time. This is his moment. 30 seconds later, there's a global pandemic. And we can't even MTRA put people in the building. Yeah. I'm the literal definition of a champion who can't put butts in seats. <laughs> so we're not allowed to have butts in the seats. You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, this is uh, a different thing. But uh, I mean, Tanahashi, you know, he's one of the guys, you know, my like New Japan match that I watched like a million times that like kind of got obsessed with the newer era of New Japan was... Uh, I watched him development all the time with Tanahashi and Suzuki. I remember having a little DVD player in the locker room with guys, you know, like Juice and Seth and whoever was in FCW at the time. And like, you got to watch this match. Check this mm -hmm. out, you know, and like stealing some of the spots on the little FCW house shows, you know. And, uh, you know, I ended up uh, never thought I'd get to wrestle Suzuki and he seemed like that was on a different planet and I was doing this thing over here, but, you know, just a big fan. Our past cross, we've wrestled a bunch of times, you know, as one of my great rivals now. Uh, and, uh, but I've never wrestled Tanahashi. Well, we wrestled in a four way. That was pretty dope in Washington a few weeks back. It's the only time. And uh, just us facing off had a really good energy because it's supposed to happen a few different times. And he was kind of always the, uh, like I could see him in the distance. Mm -hmm. Like I always talk about big game hunting in New Japan, going after, you know, they got a million belts. Who gives a shit about the belts? You know, I'm going for like the names and their reputations, you know, uh, all these legends I've got to wrestle from New Japan. It's it's pretty crazy when you think about it. Honestly. You know, when you yeah, look you at look the at, like, body of work of, less. when you look crazy. at the body of work of Ishii, Suzuki, uh, Gata, Kojima, you know, it's pretty crazy. And I've got to share the ring with all of them. But Tanahashi's still out there, almost like the final guy, you know, and uh, it's been eluding me for whatever reason. I was talking to Tony on the phone the other day, and he's like, this is the thing about, you know, now that there's a relationship and a lot of it gets out of my hands, and I'm not going back and forth between New Japan and AEW, and they're just talking on their own. It's a lot easier for me, less stress, because I don't. I can just go, oh, y'all talk about it. But then stuff can happen without your knowledge behind your back. And then Tony's on the phone with me. He's like, yeah, he's like, I'm glad I uh, stopped that match from happening like so many times. <laughs> and I kind of knew a little bit about that, but not. I didn't realize to the, the degree that he had gone to to stop that match from happening. Wow. And I was like... And that actually pisses me off, man. Like, I don't find that funny. Yeah. Like, I'm not laughing with you, man. But it doesn't matter because I'm like, this, that's my match. And it just, it seems very meant to be. And yeah. of course it is. Like, it just seems like that was the universe's plan all along. It's me, Tanahashi. At, I mean, the guy who coined Forbidden Door and the guy who was basically bridging the gap between the two forever like it just makes all the fucking yeah. sense in the world and just for me personally just wrestling Tanahashi feels very like uh just the journey I've been on just for the last three years with everything uh everything that uh from what I was three, four years ago as a wrestler, as a performer, the headspace I was in, the, you know, the uh, transformation that I've kind of been able to make and uh, what I saw myself as being three years ago when I was hurt and realized I was making a change and leaving, you know, like to now it almost feels like this is like the final step in some kind of transformation. You know, this, this is the ace. Yeah. That that's more important than any of these two hundred belts we got between these two companies. You know, like he's the ace. This is like the final final exam. Mm -hmm. You beat him. You know, so that that it for me personally. You know, it's just nobody else exists in the world except me and Tanahashi. There'll be however many thousand people there sold that house at United Center. 
two rosters, two companies, people watching on TV, whatever. Like, to me, this is about me and Tanahashi. Mm -hmm. And this is about me and my personal shit, you know? And, you know, I guess, I guess being sober is a part of that too, you know? Like, getting that negative, uh, part out of my life becoming a father all this all this change and transformation and everything you know and now i got and now i got to step in the ring with the face you know yeah so it's pretty it's pretty heavy you know it's pretty pretty heavy now it's funny for me even hearing these things because of course i know these things because we talk when these microphones are not in front of our faces but hearing it like kind of in all that context as we're like you know rehashing what this last year has looked like, all of the ups, all of the downs, personally, professionally, all of those things to know for you on this like professional level, like how much of that really culminates with this match is um, pretty cool. And yeah, it's just pretty wild. And then right after that, jump right into blood and guts. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the middle of a, a war of, uh, epic proportions with the Jericho Appreciation Society and my friends in Eddie and the Blackpool Combat Club and so forth. <laughs> so, and then we're gonna, I'm going to be in a cage match fighting to the death days later in a completely separate issue, you know? So oh my God. balancing all that is, you know, to be uh, asked to balance that as a performer is, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna call it easy, but uh, I'm not gonna call it hard. I don't know, but it's it's if any, it's something I can do. Yeah, and I'm being asked to do, and like uh, enjoy uh, responsibility of it. You know? Oh yeah. What 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 would um this second go feel like and look like for you as um AEW champ? Uh, I don't... Aside from just you know people are actually in the arenas again. Um, I think it'd probably be a lot of, cause I mean, that whole, the first one was marred by right. as much as it was great and as much, and which is crazy too, you know, like, uh, you know, I was the first, Jericho was the perfect first champion to put the belt on the map as the big, big star, former undisputed champion and so forth. I was the first baby face champion. Mm -hmm. So I was the first guy to, you know, defend it with whatever lame baby face tropes you want to throw out there honor and pride and you know not nefarious means or whatever you know to make it uh, to turn into you know the prize that you know yeah uh, a good guy can hold or I don't well, really respect know how, on it about you know everything that comes with being the first baby face champion you know you know sometimes you don't always get what you uh, think you deserve or whatever. Like sometimes like, Oh, I should be this or that, or I should be in this match or whatever. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way for, you know, and it's, but it's fine. It's good. To, you know? So like, well, we are after all the work I put into trying to bring these two sides together. Okay. Now we're doing a big pay-per-view. Am I even on the, card after <laughs> yeah. all that work i put in yeah. like what uh, you know and these motherfuckers are on the card like you, you know <laughs> there's you know there could but i was already i'd already made peace with it and i was like you know wherever however that ends up this is happening it's good for fans for wrestlers it's awesome it opens up all kinds of new doors it's a great thing I'm not gonna go into that line of thinking at all mm -hmm. but now i am in a main event so now i can you i can tap into some of that that's somewhere in my brain dt that motherfucker into oblivion and go like yeah this is my match this is my match all along it's my belt all along it's my company new japan's my company yeah yeah he's my company y'all you know what i mean there, i can tap into that like <laughs> yeah. like yeah this has already all been mine you know yeah. i can tap into that uh kind of motivation and energy you know so yeah. I, I don't know what who, who, who knows you know it's just a crazy ride uh to be on you know it sure is the, the, 
important part at the end of it, whether it's, you know, on pay-per-view in a big match or whatever. I think about this all the time when I do some of these shows, you know, I drove home the other night from Dayton, I was speedball Mike Bailey for Revolver, Sammy show, and it's had a, just such an enjoyable time. The great crowd and great fans and like, there's no money involved there's no politics involved there's yeah. no horse shit involved it, it was just wrestling beauty of just going in the ring and you know brian i think me and brian are wired similarly similarly in that uh why we do this and why we're driven to keep doing this and like what we keep coming back for he put it a lot better than i could ever put it where he's like there's something about being there in the moment doing the thing that here to do mm-hmm. just the joy of doing it uh brian in some interview put that much better than i just put it but i was like yeah that's that's the drug i keep coming back for just yeah. that like beautiful feeling of like it's great and uh like i said i was driving back from that show i had usc on on my phone Yuri Projaka, who I predicted would be light Dude, heavyweight champion a long crazy. time ago. Thank you, Yuri's my guy. <laughs> I couldn't watch it because I was driving in the rain and had my uh, had uh, my athletic brew post match in the dr- driving in my truck back home and just listening to the UFC on the speaker. You know, like kind of like listening to her on the radio because I was trying to watch the road. But I was just like in such a state of pure joy. I'm just like feeling so relaxed, so good. I'm coming home to you and my baby. It was her birthday the next day, her her big birthday 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 party. It's like life is good, man. Like Mm -hmm. that's ultimately the most important thing to just be. And I had it the other night. I had a sick ass match with uh, Tony Depp in New York City. Great venue, great crowd, just a great atmosphere. Just like, just such a joy to be there in the moment you know and like that's ultimately the most important part of what i'm chasing all the other extraneous yeah bullshit tv contracts and money and ratings and politics and this and that and everything that people put a lot of mental energy into i could give at the end of the day Mm -hmm. it's about being there in the ring in that moment. Yeah. You know, and that might sound cheesy and it might sound full of shit, but like I've been through some shit Mm -hmm. over these years. And that's the one thing that has, at the end of it, I realized that's like the best part about this man. And, you know, yeah, it's, you know, uh, to, to steal a line from Regal, I've lived a charmed life. (laughs) Charmed. I just like I'm just so f- uh, excited, man, to to do this. You know, on, it's on cool. Sunday. It's so cool to like, like I love seeing you get to do what you do and knowing the the purity in how much you love what you get to do. And I can't just say like, oh, you're so lucky that you get to do this thing that you love to do because you you obviously work so hard to do it, but you've also set your life up by design to really be able to do those things that you want to do, like being able to go and wrestle these matches. You want to drive up to Dayton and go do those things because it's a thing that like really makes you happy. And it's just, it's really, it's just so nice for me to be able to see you do that. You're such a man of your word and you, you there's, there's like that simplicity to it, that it's a thing that you love to do. So you go and do it. And if there's people that question like you wanting to wrestle on a bunch of different shows and doing all these things when like you, you don't have to do any of those things. It's just a thing that you love doing, but it's nice to, it's nice for me to see you do that. And it actually like inspires me to like, without making this like extra cheesy, but honestly it does. It like pumps me up to see you just be so happy doing the thing that you love doing and learning and thinking. And like your brain is just like, always your wheels are always spinning thinking about different things that you want to do and you're never just an autopilot about your work it's i wouldn't even necessarily call it that but it does pay our bills so thank you for that yeah it does (laughs) does 
Let's pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like but it's yeah, you, you've done it. You've done good. And I just uh, keep, I, I, but I think I can get a lot. Like I said, I don't feel like I've been near a hundred percent this year so far. Yeah. It's been a pretty, pretty sick year as far as just like having good matches, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, I think it's all starting to come together. Right now. Yeah. Well, my, Yeah, that's all. So I think it's just, but to me, that feels like just a starting point. Mm -hmm. Kind of like now I'm to the baseline that I've been kind of attempting to get to for like three years. Or like what I can do from now on, I don't have anything, uh, any real uh, negative thing. Like hindrances. Let's stop drinking. This is what I'm getting at. So yeah. that, you know, the booze but, and that's not I still, it. still have to deal with the challenges of you know the nightmares and the night sweats and the chemical imbalances Those and all night that shit. sweats we didn't but, even uh, talk about the night sweats yeah it's wild man i've never seen it it's like, like in my in life sauna. it's not a, every time but it's, no, no 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 uh, but when it hits it hits hard it's he literally i came upstairs one day and you were like still you slept in a little bit and i came upstairs and you're like feel the pillow you're sleeping on my side of the bed and you're like, feel the pillow. It literally felt like somebody threw a bucket of water on this pillow. Like yeah, I could not wild. believe how soaked you were. Yeah, yeah but I think from here on out, like I'm just gonna keep getting better. And I got like good teammates around me in the, the Blackpool Combat Club, but I've got like just an amazing guy. The freaking AEW roster dude, is so stacked. Yeah. It's crazy. Like I would put, I mean, just look at it. I don't, without even having to single anybody no. out or, or name any names for fear of missing one. Cause yeah. there's just a litany of like dudes who can be main eventers, who can have a freaking awesome match, who can wrestle all these different styles, who, like who are super over, just like the litany of guys. Like, as far as like mainstream American wrestling, I would say it's probably, there has been a roster of the stacked since like 2000 WWF, yeah. like when it was like two, 2000, 2001, when you went, oh my gosh, they got like Rock, right? Austin, oh, Rock, yeah. Triple H, Undertaker, Angle, Benoit, Jericho, Regal, the Dudleys, the Hardys, Edge and Christian, mm -hmm. like they had Everybody. Lita, like Trish. Uh, Every, they had just like such a crazy roster all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Look at AEW, man. You yeah. know, like it's crazy. You know, somebody goes down, somebody just steps right in. Yeah. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. You know what I mean? Like, who can wrestle? I don't know. Kyle O'Reilly? Oh, I don't know. One of the best wrestlers in the world. Yeah. You know, like, because we got, we got him just laying around, we you know? Him, yeah. We got him everywhere, you know? Loved wrestling Kyle O'Reilly, man. That yeah. You guys awesome. tore it up. That was, you guys were really well and that, prepared. And that was great, man. Cause, uh, I never wrestled him before. And, uh, what was great about that is we didn't have a lot of time to talk because he had a battle royal before that he had to, you know, talk with. Those are hard to put together with everybody. Uh, get into a battle royal. I had a promo. I had a promo. You know, we don't didn't have really much time to talk. Like thirty minutes. Uh, how much time we got? I don't know. So there's really no time to put together any kind of crazy plan or anything. It was just like, how much time? Okay. Uh, basically, basically, we just like, I was like, first half, we'll do whatever. Second half, uh, maybe this, maybe that, maybe that. Well, yeah, okay, I'll just see you out there. And uh, <laughs> that's when I'm like, sometimes like at my best when I'm just calling in the ring. One, it's like more fun. You can't do that with everybody, you know, uh, with Kyle, obviously you can. Uh, and he's, cause he's so good. Like there's, of all, he might be one of the only guys that I've ever gone to do a match with on live TV, no less, without talking at all, but been so completely calm and mm -hmm. confident that I'm like, this is going to be fine yeah we're gonna, i just knew we were gonna like just gel like we're great opponents you know so hopefully i wrestle him and we beat the shit of each other a million more times yeah uh i feel like i'm at my best sometimes like that because i'm 
not worried about thinking about memorizing stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes I feel like I'm doing stuff, but I'm thinking like two or three steps ahead. Whereas if I don't have any idea what's coming next, I'm only thinking about what I'm doing right now. Yeah, it's easier to be present. Then I'm like present in the moment and do everything is like a little sharper and a little better. And, and it's almost more enjoyable because I'm not thinking about anything. And you know, sometimes you have to remember so much, like there's run-ins and TV and times and this and that and all, this, all these crazy sports entertainment things you have to remember so much that when it's over it's like a relief yeah it's like okay that was awesome Ooh, ah, that, we got through it and it was great but when you're just making it up as you go along it's like an even better feeling yeah you're just like completely in like if i'm throwing a punch or grab if i'm bringing this arm it's twisting his arm doing. That's all I'm thinking about because yeah. I don't have anything else. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. What's, I don't have to worry about the power driver. I'm going to get power driven with in three minutes because I don't know what's coming. <laughs> you know, so. uh, well, listen, I'm super excited to uh, I get to come down to Forbidden Door with you. I mean, the sweet little baby chicken will be there. Yeah, uh, that was watch another you do your thing. Best decision I ever made was maybe for one of the most moving Cincinnati. Dude. What a back home. I wish we could turn the camera. Around I know the sunset the that just happened while we were here talking. I kept looking at it too. It was really beautiful. Skyline of Cincinnati. We're uh we got a little privacy where we're at, but we're right downtown in the action, you know. It's proper so Cincinnati, much. you know. Uh when we do the next show here, I'll be five minutes from the arena. So yeah. that'll be awesome. But uh now we my can point is you that those west coast trips were killing me and uh you know i used to leave my house on like tuesdays 10 in the morning and get a hotel in jacksonville at like 1 a.m so the Ooh. whole whole day going just drinking at the airport drinking on the plane you know it's like nothing to do you just waste entire days in the yeah. airport i think i just got used to it yeah because i lived in vegas long enough but now, like when we went out west the other day, I was like, I can't oh my believe God, I did I this know. flight every week. What the, I heck, know. what the hell was I thinking? Because so many, <gasps> most of the shows are on the East Coast. So now I can, I can either fly in day of or drive to almost every show. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, so Chicago, nice little just jump in the truck, drive right up. Detroit, drive right up. You know, St. Yeah. Louis, drive right up. So I'm centrally located now. We're doing it's it. Awesome. So I can bring you and show off the... Uh, a little, a little, a little, a little baby. Who's crying, by the way? So we should probably wrap this up and tend to her. Yeah. Get that little sweet little chicken. I realize I talk in the baby voice like all the time now. Like, <laughs> it's actually my favorite voice. Like walking into the started. bank, talking to Teller in a baby voice. <laughs> I'd like to get part of this check, please. <laughs> Can I get one in here, check in the bank? My favorite thing about the voice is I'm so used to hearing it, but when you do talk in it a lot, and then people that aren't used to seeing it are like, what the fuck? Let's say the stupidest stuff to babies. <laughs> babies, <laughs> dogs, like yeah. nobody's safe. I get talked to in this voice now. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so stupid. But guys, listen, babies are great. Booze is bad. Wrestling's great. I, you know, I still drinking inherently and it's of in and of itself. It's not bad. No, just overdoing it's bad. Yeah. I mean, I support, you know, the, uh, I support products, you know, Jack Daniels is a fine product. If you're going <laughs> to responsibly enjoy a smooth Tennessee whiskey, you know, it's got my <laughs> stamp of approval. <laughs> they can give me a sponsorship too, but you know, no, they can't. I actually. Not, uh, I, they can't. I, I, I've, given them plenty of my money they don't yeah, need you have. You i've have. had i've had my fill thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well you look like a million bucks you're you're coming around you're feeling good things are coming up john it's working out i'm not gonna end this with some like cheesy i'm proud of you i love you but i am those things should we uh should we kiss no come on hit me with it no, it's too weird, man. You can end with a joke. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, hit everyone with a joke. Three weeks ago, I sent my hearing aid in for repairs. Oh, really? 
Yeah, I've heard nothing since. <laughs> so stupid. 